Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Evan, and uh, here's Pushkar. And we're going to be talking today about pod security policy. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, you're muted. Yes. Okay, you Thank you, Evan. Uh, I'm Pushkar Zogekar. I work uh, with Evan and also in upstream in Kubernetes 6 security, as well as uh, in CNCF security tag. I've been always looking forward to DGI case in the past as a viewer and excited to be one of the people on the other side this time. Um, okay, so usually the first part of this is um, putting together the show notes. So um, let's take a look at those. Yeah. And um, for those of you who um, don't recall, the show notes are at tgik.io slash notes. You can see it in the upper corner. Um, feel free to add your own notes to that. Um, exciting stuff that happened in the last week. Well, in the last two weeks since we since TGIK was last live, um, we had our first hybrid cube con. So for those of you who have been living completely under a rock for the last year or so. Um, we didn't have KubeCon last year um, because of this little pandemic thing. Um, and now we're slowly inching our way back to normal. And so LA was a mix of people in person with social distancing and masks and stuff like that and online sessions. And um, I'd say I was there in person, but about half the... Uh, events were pre-recorded and the other half were um you know live with questions from both online audiences and in-person audiences um and the cncf has a bunch of pictures i think there's also a photo album um uh, but yeah yeah um, i don't know if anyone wants to link or in the talk um mention any talks that they found were particularly good uh, yeah i mean for for me that. my first kubecon was in person i remember uh, that which was the last in person kubecon we had in san diego and then i was kind of hoping to go back again and took for a forever almost like almost 2 years since we have been in san diego and turns out we were a few miles away from san diego in la this time so it, it definitely was very weird, different, and interesting to be back with uh, people. And I think hybrid sort of worked for both of us. Like we met bo both of us for the first time together in KubeCon as well. Uh, this KubeCon, it was rather. Warm. Yeah, it, it <laughs> was de definitely warm and another wonderful city to visit, which is, I think, one of the great things about in person events. You get to be in places you have never been before. So I actually attended a couple of the day zero events um, and one of the really, one of the, one of the talks that was pretty interesting to me um, was at the clouds, um, the supply chain security con um, conference. Um, someone, uh, someone from solar winds gave a talk about how they were rebuilding all of their push all of their build and, and push pipelines um, to be much more paranoid. And uh, it was really interesting um, if you get a chance to catch it on YouTube or if you can go back in and watch it. Um, uh, you know, it was all about they're building everything twice and comparing the checksums. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and that think... seems to be the world that we may be headed towards. Yeah, exactly. And just the sheer number of co-located events this time was huge compared to previous KubeCons. And still, there were so many good sessions in KubeCon day one, two, and three. I see some familiar faces joining in on yeah. comments. We've got got people. Wow. Well, it is up pretty late, um, as is Yuka, uh, Finland and Saudi Arabia. Right. And lots of folks. We seem to get the late crowd here. 
that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't attend the EBPF day, but it seemed like that was pretty popular. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we had an, another cloud native security con. I think the whole cloud native security con, if I'm not wrong, started either in San Diego or after that. So this was like a coming back of security con in person. And we had a clear focus, I felt, on security this time, even in the main event with uh, some keynotes and many, many talks talking about security. One of my favorite talks was, I don't know if others in who've joined in also watched it, was the one on uh, burnout by Julia Simon. Oh, that was uh, a good talk. Yeah. I, I was lucky enough to be a track host for that talk and got to ch chat and listen in so many people. Like That was probably the most uh, uh, attendees uh, in, in, in person as well as virtual from what I could remember. Definitely a good talk considering all of the stuff we have all been through. Uh, I think there are some good personal lessons to learn from that. And hopefully somebody there, some felt like, okay, they are not alone in this. Can and you can great. you chime in with the author or with the, the speaker's name? I forgot that yeah. one. Yeah, uh, um, that was Ju Julia Simon. Uh, just a reminder that everyone can type into those notes at the same time and it all shows up. Yes. Um, and, and the URL is also simple, tgik.io slash notes. Yep. Um, and... if, you, if you know anyone who has reviewed KubeCon already and have a blog post written down, I know a few of them have done that already. So put in those links as well. There was a fun talk. Um, Ian did like two in a row um, one of those days, but uh, it was uh, seven of nine Kubernetes security secrets. And um, oh, was it Brad? I Gosh. No worries. It's um, fine. <laughs> thank you. Um, and they had a lot of fun ways to get stuff running in a Kubernetes cluster that maybe wasn't what <laughs> you might yeah. expect. Uh, it, it was also fun in kind of going back in history and sharing that why seven of nine is sort of relevant historically for yeah. Kubernetes. For so for those of you not in the know, um, Kubernetes started at Google, um, which already had a cluster operating system called Borg. Um, and so um, the internal project was called project seven, referencing seven of nine which was a particularly friendly converted Borg um, from, I think, Voyager, from the Voyager series. So this was a friendly Borg that would um, help people move forward towards this world of cluster operating systems. Because um, at the time, it was really clear how to run containers on a single instance, but it wasn't totally clear how to take just a pile of computers and run a pile of containers on them without worrying about this container map specifically to this, you know, to this computer. Yep. Yep. Alex, it, it is definitely a Star Trek reference. And yes, I am also very happy about the rains. Uh, and now sunny weekend, hopefully uh, we definitely <laughs> needed the rain. So I'm glad about that too. Seattle gets rain all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I see some folks, Ahmed yeah. from Berlin and uh, Aga from Pakistan. Great. It's kind of late for you in Pakistan. Yeah. Thank you for joining. Wow. Or yeah. early. I'm not sure when that line <laughs> crosses. Uh, yeah, I had a fun. I had fun doing my talk there. Um, I did a talk and um, rebuilt the demo <laughs> that day. Um, but uh, it was it was fun. I got to play with cl with um, cloud native build packs, which is a project that I've sort of poked at from a distance. But now I've gotten into the guts of, I guess. Um, I don't know if there's any core Kubernetes news this week. Um, I haven't seen any big 
announcements or anything like that. So everyone's still digesting 122 and isn't quite, you know, the March on 123 hasn't started too much yet, I think. Yes. I, if I remember correctly, the only announcement is code freeze is coming soon uh, ah. for the new release for 1.23. So the deadline is November 16. I'll just add the link there. So yeah, awesome. if you're contributing and want to make sure it goes in the next release, that's the link. Um, yeah, and uh, I work on a little project called Knative, and so um, we've all been excited because we're going to number our next release 1.0. Um, lots of the individual components have been GA, but now we feel like our documentation and so forth. Oh, yeah, definitely throw that in um, about uh, cluster API went to V1 as well. Um, Knative has a bunch of V1 APIs, but the top level version number was 0 0.26, which is um, a both a big and a small number. Um, and so the next one, we're going to be starting over the numbering scheme. Yes, and cluster API had a blog post in celebration of version one in the Kubernetes official blog. So definitely recommend that as well. I'll put in a link there. Oh, awesome. I'll let you do that. Uh, and with that roundup, we're probably going to dive a little bit into pod security policy. Um, so for those of you not in the know, oh gosh, I'm going to close up Twitter. Um, pod security policy is uh, deprecated. So this is all about a feature that um, you don't want to get on board with because it's going away. But we're also going to talk about why it's going away and the problems it's trying to solve and how we're doing it better next time. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more detail about the history and so forth? Yeah, it, it's so interesting. Like, I think this is one of the most popular features from security perspective in Kubernetes. And it's really like the historical context behind this is Red Hat OpenShift has something called security context constraints, which is SCC. And that was created before PSPs came into picture in upstream. And that was a big uh, sort of influence or uh, uh, something that led to people thinking, okay, this might make sense to have in upstream as well. And then that's when port security policies came into picture. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there were very few fields that were supported and then slowly, slowly features kept getting added. But at the same time, we also saw some external admission controllers being created. Like I'm seeing comments about OPA and so many others, uh, Kiborno and few others that people are fans of started coming in and they were able to actually do the right thing in terms of allowing people the flexibility to manage policy outside of the Kubernetes domain and be very specific in terms of what you want to allow and disallow. So that really changed the game. And then there were a lot many other things that happened. So we can keep going if people are interested about what happened after that. Um, I don't know how much we want to talk about, like, so what's, like, what's the headline that people really wanted out of this feature? I think the biggest thing was when port security policies were created was, I want my security team to have one place to define what is allowed in my cluster. And then the reason it became deprecated is like a couple of reasons based on like, you cannot have something in beta forever. That was a policy that was created, which led to really big discussion on, okay, this has been in beta for a while. And secondly, like as more people started using this and all the other external controllers was the usability is not that great. And that's just like being very nice about what the usability was for port security policies. And that's sure. where the whole deprecation and the newer feature that's called port security admission came into picture. 
So pod security is really about making sure that, um, you know, there's a bunch of interesting fields on the pod spec where if you set them, you can assume basically full control of the kubelet. Um, stuff like privileged, um, stuff like these host PID, host network, and so forth. Um, volume types, if you can if you can mount a host path volume that gives you um, the kubelets certificate, for example, then you can act as the kubelet to the API server. And then from there, you can probably leverage that to get yourself able to modify the kubelet and escape from Kubernetes. And so this is, this is kind of a big security layer on the container front. Um, and Docker has some defaults and Kubernetes overrides some of those defaults and some of the overrides are um, less secure. Right. Some of the overrides are just different and some of the Docker defaults aren't great. For example, mm -hmm. Docker defaults to your containers run as root unless you declare that you run as some other user. Um, and then Kubernetes overrides that with um, a run as user, which also defaults to zero. <laughs> So, um, but if it's unset rather than zero, it will use whatever the Docker container says to run as. So that might be safe and that might not, but you can't tell until you actually try to exec that pod. Right. Um, and I am, I think we're getting a question from Carlos related to that. Like what usability problem are we talking about? So you're right, Carlos, that the security context uh, and this is very, I think, useful and important point. Regardless of PSP or pod security admission, the security context piece is not changing at all. We can still use it and they're not really relevant in terms of migration from one to another. But the main thing as an example was you couldn't do a dry run with a PSP for what will happen if I apply a pod security policy to my existing cluster for a few namespaces. Is this going to allow me to essentially fail uh, things, or, or would I know well before failing, uh, so that I can have some confidence that this policy is actually going to work as expected? So that dry run feature is something that came up in the newer replacement, which I hope we get to play around with. We will. We will get to play around with that a little later. I feel like this is another big um, problem with pod security policies. Um, this is a feature which is off by default. And when you turn it on, it slams the door closed until you set up security policies that allow your existing pods to run. Right. And so um, I've got a cluster, you know, I've, I've set up two clusters um, and, you know, we can, we can try turning on pod security policy um, admission controller and then see about running a new pod and, uh, you know, we'll see that it doesn't work, but then I can also go and kill some existing pods and we'll see what happens there too. Yeah, exactly. Correct. I think that's going to be fun to know what happens when PSP is disabled and you have existing pods. And when it's enabled, you try to create a new pod. What happens to that and what happens to the existing pods? So definitely going to be helpful. Yeah, there, Eric's pointing out as well. Um, yeah. There's a lot of good bits in this blog post um, at the top of the pod security that describes some of the problems that um, it went away. And uh, there's a great talk um, yeah. from uh, San Diego in 2019 um, that describes some of the problems there too. Yeah, there are also two great talks that I hope will be up next week by this time. Uh, in this year's KubeCon. One was from uh, Tabby and Tim Allclair, where they sort of told the history about what some of the blog is covering. And then there is another one from Sigoth as in the maintainer track, which went deep into how this actually works and what do you can you expect by a lot of good detailed demos on it. So let's see, how do we turn on the admission control? So um, let's see. 
about sharing this. Okay. Oh, that's fun. Um, so here I've got a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we're running version 122, so we've got the different APIs available. And let's see, we've got some pods. And this is just on a single node. So let's see, let's just SSH in. see I should really should have had another one of these I always forget that I want to be on the node and also able to use cube control at the same time right People are asking you even why are you using Windows? Um, for a desktop system, um, Windows is pretty nice. Um, and you'll note that I'm running Linux here um, mostly because using some of the Kubernetes stuff and some of the scripts and so forth, um, I often find that when you copy things, um, people use backslash line breaks which um, is a bashism, it turns out, and PowerShell uses a different character to escape um, new lines because backslash is the Windows directory separator. Um, but yeah, so I like to develop on Windows in part because it turns out that like half the world or more has a Windows machine as their their desktop machine to work with. So I like to remember you know, what that feels like and um, it's also a little bit more powerful than my MacBook, so um, I like to use it for streaming. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Like I, I when I started working and writing code, I couldn't afford a MacBook. It's just like completely out of the picture. So you just end up using Windows and then run VirtualBox on top, and then run your Unix or Ubuntu or Fedora, whatever you like, on on a VM, and that turned out pretty well and I got to learn all the basics through Windows. So yes, I think MacBook, when you can afford it, is great, but Windows is not too bad too. Um, there's actually some magic they've done recently too. Um, so I'm in Linux here, but um, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to show this off because it amazes me every single time. I can run um, VS Code and it will pop up a native Windows 10 window, which I guess you can't see here. But if you don't have VS Code Server installed, it will download VS Code Server into Windows Subsystem for Linux and then bounce out to Windows using server mode um, of, of VS Code, which I find kind of amazing and mind boggling. Yes, and also related feature that I've been using a lot for markdown changes is switching github.com to github.dev and then just making changes in the browser itself. Yeah. Um, but so I'm looking here, um, we've got one admission plugin, which is node restriction. Um, so we're going to need to add the pod security poly policy admission controller. So we're gonna go back over here and manifest uh, API server and See. That should come up in a minute or two, and if I screwed it up, then we will figure it out later. So that's exciting. Um, where am I getting this answer from?
Because I'm saying, I, I'm asking, get me the pods, and it's not showing the API server pod, but I'm pretty sure it's running. What's our uh, context on kubectl? Um, oh, that was what I wanted to do. Uh, there we go. Um, Oh, well, that's not very useful. Um, give me just a moment. Um, but I'm pretty sure this is the same cluster because if we look at the other cluster, we've got all the pods, including Cube API, API server running. Right, so yeah. This and the API server has different. to be answering things. Right. Like otherwise, we wouldn't get the list of pods. Exactly. Um, but it's not showing up in this list. I have a guess as to why, but um, I'm guessing that Kubelet is actually logging complaints that it's not allowed to run API server. So we are getting it tries some. To register the static pod. Yeah, we're getting some suggestions from the uh, yeah. from the viewers. Looks like uh, Walid is saying because they are mirror pods and not allowed by PSP to create pods, they are created by Kubelet. Uh, and let's see what the logs are saying. Yep. Creating a mirror pod for um, for Cube API server is forbidden because the pod security policy says we're not allowed to add this pod. Right. And the pod security policy we applied yet, or we just oh, enabled we, the we fact? We turned on the pod security policy admission controller. Ah, just the controller without the and policies. we have no pod security policies. Ah, that explains so, it. So, um, yeah, so this is, this is an awesome failure mode, I will point out, where your static pods start to disappear from your system if you modify them because Kubelet tries to mirror them back and is told, no, you're not allowed to do that. Um, in addition, any new pods that we tried to create would also get blocked. Um. Yeah, exactly. This is, <laughs> this is where the dry run feature might have been helpful. Yeah. Um. And then... So my guess would be we would have to create a policy first and allow a specific namespace to run as privileged. Yeah, let's go back to the docs. Uh, so let's see. Enabling pod security policies. Uh, yeah, it's recommended that policies are added and authorized before enabling the admission controller. If you don't read that sentence, <laughs> you're going to be sad. Um, uh, and then in order to use it, um, either the requesting user or the target pod service account needs to be authorized to use the policy. So and, this and is kind of fun because there's two different avenues where you can end up having pod security applied and you're allowed to do something or not. One is yeah. the user who created things and the other is um, the service account it's running as. Correct. And this is one of the most interesting change between pod security admission and pod security policy because you could bind the policy in the past to a service account or a, any entity that is authorized to do something. And now in pod security admission, you can either apply the pod security to the entire cluster with exception list, or you can apply it to the entire namespace. So now you can't have two different policies within your namespace because now the policy can be applied to all the pods in the namespace in the newer feature. Okay. So I think for us, if you scroll down a bit more in the docs. Uh, just a minute. I saw that Hai is asking a question. Oh. Would this be the same behavior for OPA if we put if we enable OPA as a, on the cluster, but with no OPA policy, pod policy. 
Um, this depends on how OPA is designed and structured. So um, when you're designing a system from the ground up, it's great to put in a secured up by default situation where um, you say, hey, you're not allowed to you know, create pods that are unsafe unless someone specifically enables it. The problem is that we're going into an existing system here that's already running. And so you may not want your default to be lock everything down to be secure because you may actually be breaking existing things that are working. Um, Istio had this problem in, in version one, when, in their 1.0 version. When you installed Istio, it would immediately lock down the cluster so that you couldn't do any network traffic, which meant that installing Istio was a breaking change. And then after you had it installed, you needed to open things up again, but you couldn't do this without having some downtime or routing stuff to a different cluster. Effectively, your cluster had downtime. Um, so it's something to think about when you're designing one of these policies is, how do people get from the state where they don't have it on to the state where they do have it on? Um, and pod security policy didn't really think about that. So it's sort of, a, if you didn't start with this, it's gonna be really painful to get there later. And when we start talk, when we start poking at pod security a little bit later, after I've built up the pain a little more, um, we'll see how we've solved some of these sorts of problems. Um, so it looks like EKS um, has a pod security policy that's already installed. So in that sense, you've 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 gotten past it by having defined these things. Um, the fact that it's not default in Kubernetes though means that you can't rely on it being everywhere. Um, even better, since this is a flag on the API server, you may be stuck with whatever on or off your cluster provider, whoever's creating the cluster has set. Um, I'm not sure if, if like GKE or DigitalOcean or um, Azure has, you know, exposes that list where you can go and add extra strings to it. Cause it is a maintenance concern. You know, how many different snowflakes can we do? You know, if you've got five Booleans, do you want to have 32 different possible cluster configurations you have to support? Yeah, I think this is the classic fail open or fail close design problem. And the privileged PSP, I think have, being there just sort of allows you to run anything you want. And then you keep knocking it down as much as needed until you feel like, okay, I'm only running everything that's needed uh, with the limited permissions that I need. So it looks like um, we're already seeing hints of the new format. Um, so let's take a look at what this privileged. Um, so here's a privileged pod security policy and we've got the whole thing. So um, I'm just gonna apply it to my cluster. It's probably not that exciting. So I'm not gonna go and show it. Also one thing I would say is uh... Privileged is essentially as good as root on every node. So if that's the default PSP on your cluster, we don't really have any or very little isolation, if any, uh, but, on the cluster. But in order to say that, it takes, I'm going to blow this up a little bit so people can see. Yeah, yeah. It takes um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. It takes 20 some ish lines to say you can do anything you want. Good. Um, but maybe baseline is a better idea. Let's see what baseline looks like. Um, oops. So baseline, um, well, gosh, that's shorter <laughs> or not. <laughs> so this is this is sort of your minimum safe set. This is your kind of default. Yeah, I think this is a good middle ground between restricted and privileged where you're not completely restricting it to the least amount possible in terms of privilege, but it's not completely privileged as well. It's 74 lines, <laughs> this file. So that's your, 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 hey, you're not doing completely crazy stuff. Only takes 74 lines to spell out. Oh. Um, so that's one of the problems. Um, with pod security policy as well is that, um, and no, this says things like allow all the volume types except host path. We have to spell out all of these types and assume that there aren't gonna be more in the future. 
Um, yeah, and this is another thing that was introduced in the new feature, versioning of policies, where if something doesn't exist in a previous version and you're upgrading, you can upgrade your cluster and upgrade the policy after and keep the policy to a lower version before. Oh, so it sounds like you're actually saying that there is a security hole here where if I have this pod security policy and Kubernetes adds a new security sensitive field um, and I go and upgrade my Kubernetes cluster until I've gone and upgraded my pod security policy after that upgrade, I'm potentially vulnerable. Right. So that new field. Correct. So what will happen is if I'm on 123, uh, cluster version and my PSP is 120 or, or port security admission is pointing to 122 and a new feature is added in 123, I won't be able to use it. So that's where the recommendation is start your port security when you upgrade a cluster with a warn mode for the latest version so that you see what you're missing and then you can enable it later. Um, and then here is an example using, um, oh, so this is another interesting thing. Um, pod security policies use RBAC to, um, to actually do the application. So this is, um, this is basically a cluster role binding. So applying it across the entire cluster that references a cluster role that describes the pod security policy. Um, let me go back and look here. Is this? So there needs to be a cluster role as well. I think we just scrolled past it a bit. Yeah, we there, just scrolled past it yeah, up here. Yeah. Um, so you need to create a cluster role that references the pod security policy and says you're allowed to use it, which is a special RBAC verb. And then with that, then you can go down here and do a role binding that maps you to a particular, um, you know, to, to one of these things. So you kind of have like three resources you need to look at as well. Um, and you need to understand Kubernetes RBAC and the particular way it's used here in order to figure out what's gonna happen. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of like a, a chocolate block where if you have to eat it, you have to remove the wrapper, then remove the foil, and then you get the chocolate. Um, so yeah, and unfortunately, it looks like because all this is security sensitive stuff and everyone wants to set up their cluster a little differently, um, this suggests, oh, bind these to specific namespaces like development or canary or something like that. But there's not actually a recipe I can copy to follow and just have a secure cluster. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's a lot of manual labor for sure. I was I was looking at, oh, let's just make my cluster, you know, let's copy and paste and bring my cluster back into compliance. And it's not going to be copy and paste here. Um, it's going to be, you know, okay, maybe I can copy this cluster role binding and adjust it. And maybe I think baseline is sufficient for my cluster so I can bind that to system service accounts. And that means right. all the service accounts. But I'm still going to need to um, go up here and copy this cluster role and fill in a name, and um, which probably needs to be um, PSP baseline, right? In order for this to work, and then I need to fill out that list of resource names. And so, you know, <laughs> at the end of all of this, we're going to have like 100, 110, 120 lines of cluster config. Um, to keep track of and so forth. Correct. Uh, and, and I think this is one of- points out, This isn't actually everything you need for a secure cluster. Mm -hmm. um, without this, you don't have a secure cluster, but right. this doesn't guarantee that your cluster is secure. Exactly. It's just one of the many things. And the sad part of all of this was, this is so niche in terms of knowledge, even within Kubernetes that if you had a cluster as an end user and you wanted port securities enabled on your namespace, you would have to either figure out the admin of the cluster and tell that person, hey, please do this for me. And the admin is doing 100 more things that to just keep the cluster alive. So then 
this was also another big thing where it was so hard for the admins to just make this better so they would just rather not do this and maybe let opa and other things they, take care they of may it. not even know about it Correct. Um, right but yeah and then this this all this pod security policy machinery that we're sh that we're showing you you know all of this stuff only applies to pods so any other resources you have that might be security sensitive you can't reuse anything you know here exactly. it's all different and so this that is where people get excited about stuff like opa is there's two things one um opa makes it at least a little easier to say um any volume as long as it's not host path right um as opposed to needing to have a list a positive list of all the volume types that aren't host path um and the other thing is that opa allows you to actually um apply other policies someone's asking about um checking for example that um you know a pod was built with the right security processes and so forth um and pod security policy has nothing to say about that you can run you know the evilest image you want and pod security policy is fine with that yeah the, there is no checks for vulnerabilities in this psp mm -hmm. or any standard and nothing for network policies also um so we're going to be talking about warn modes in yeah. in a little bit um we're almost done pointing out the the <laughs> challenges here with pod security policy um but yeah and this is not to say you know oh pod security policy was a terrible idea or even it was a terrible implementation it was pod security policy was introduced in kubernetes 1.3 or 1.4 correct and it's a hard problem and we didn't get it right the first time and that shouldn't be a big shock in terms of APIs. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, just like adding on to that, we didn't have our back at that time. We didn't have admission <laughs> controllers that are that exist today. And we did yeah. as a community, I think we were less mature and the project was new. So at that time, we made the best decision that made sense in that particular context. And that is why we have deprecation cycles where you get to fix things that now don't make sense and so yeah um one of the things you would have seen as you were watching me apply this stuff to my cluster was um warnings from the api server which still isn't being admitted into the uh, list of pods yet um that uh, all these pod security policies i were i was defining are deprecated in um 121 and going away in 125. um so now we've explained why this old thing that's going away is going away. Um, let's talk about the new shiny thing a little. Um, is this this blog post probably the best? Yeah, this is the most, I think, uh, hands-on blog post to get this working in a cluster. It does awesome. use kind though. So we'll have to maybe that's make fine. some modifications with Minikube. Um, so yeah, so the first thing to know is this new pod security admission stuff. Um, it's new, right? Yeah, it's new. Uh, I actually s remember writing code for this a uh, few months back when we released it in alpha. And one of the sh things I wanted to give a shout out was if anyone is sort of new to Golang or Kubernetes project as a whole, uh, look at how this is implemented and especially the testing framework. I think it was one of the best things I saw uh, in, in terms of how you can make something that is difficult to write easier for others so that somebody who is not very familiar with go or kubernetes can pick it up so in in summary what it did was it created auto generating test cases by letting the test case fail after you run, write a code for let's say host network feature and then when it failed and you said okay fix this it automatically created the test which allowed it to pass so which was very very brilliant and i think shout out to jordan and Tim all clear for going through and writing all of that. But also you said this is alpha. Yeah. So in the if I remember in the last version it was alpha, then upcoming one there is there is another cap that is going to improve on that. Yeah. So we're gonna need to go in and turn on the feature gate. Yep. Um, 
I'm guessing I don't have this is an API server flag, right? That yes, it should or be feature a gates. feature feature gate flag. Yes. Okay, so let's do that. Um, can't go worse than the last time. <laughs> yes. Or so also, while it I've is got a different background, so you can keep track. Yeah. Um, this is the broken. Um, this is the broken one. Also, Valid is sharing that uh, Which we should have... have another code review session for TGIK, uh, which talks about how the port security admission is implemented. I think that's a yeah. good, good suggestion. We'll try to see if Jordan or Tim can join us in that one. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Here I am over here. Um, Kubernetes manifest, Cube API server. I'll turn that volume down a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, your gates is pod security cube. Monster. So we will alphabetize this. And let's see. One thing at a time, it's getting restarted. And um, let's see. All right, let's see what's going on. Um, let's see. Well, it's complaining about not being able to reach the API server, but it doesn't seem to have logs that Indicate a problem. Um, trying to delete pod. Uh, I think if the text is a bit bigger, it might be easier for folks to look at it. What? If the text is a bit bigger, I think it will be easier to oh. folks looking at it. Yeah, I was just, if anyone has a good suggestion about where to look at the API server logs when your API server is dead. <laughs> um, what if we revert the change and see how the normal state looks yeah. like? That was my next thought. Looking for a lot. Oh, CRI, CRI control. That's a good idea. Well, let's see. First of all, it's still. Created X eight seconds ago. Eight seconds oh, ago. here's one that's not ready. Right. Okay, let's see. That's what the log path. Um, oh, Carlos, I have two different clusters. Yeah. Um, this is the cluster with pod security policy. And you can see that it still doesn't have a cube API server 
and this one is the one that um, we're turning on pod security admission on. Note the names are super close, pod security admission and pod security policy. So um, yeah, I, I have been worried that I'm not going to get the names right. <laughs> I have many clusters because I keep breaking them. Yeah, and I exactly. like throwing them away. Um, I think we'll let's see. What if we use inspect on this um, completed? Let's go back and try. Do we have any? I'll try to search for any documentation of enabling feature gates with Minikube. Maybe some small uh, yeah. double quote or square bracket or something is missing. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. Um, okay, here's the new. Here's the new Cube API server. Why did Cube Scheduler get started too? Let's see. So here's Cube Controller Manager and Activator and Cube Scheduler. I don't see a Cube API server running. <laughs> so everything else except API server is up? It looks like it, um, which is unfortunate because API server is kind of the one you want. Like if you're going to have one pod, you might as well make it API server. <laughs> the the docs I'm seeing for Minikube don't mm -hmm. have the feature flag gate uh, option in a config file. Oh, so, it's you're right. It's probably in a config file, not in a not in the API server. Yeah, so they have it mostly uh, feature gate is just added as a command line argument when you start Minikube. When you start, yeah, okay. Where do, well, I can always spin up a kind, kind cluster if necessary. Um, but one of the nice things here is that when you turn it on, it doesn't do anything um rather than immediately slamming closed um yeah and, and this might not just like be pod security admission behavior just a feature gate being this is this, well this is me not being able to turn on a feature gate um, right right but uh does feel like something you should be able uh Gosh, there are a lot of feature gates out there. Um, but no one actually wants to say where these things get stuck on disk. I know they have to go to disk because otherwise, um, it says using feature gates command line flag on each Kubernetes component. Uh, what does the log say? Um, so I'm not sure, Choco, which log you're thinking of. I can run kube control um, get events kube system, but I'm not uh, it would help yeah. if I ran this over here. Events. Um, oh, hmm, we found. Oh, something. I do get logs for this. Um, uh, 
it's showing some volume error places. for CA certs. So it says back off restarting failed container, but um, its current state is going to be ready. And I'm not sure how to grab the logs out from a pod that's now healthy from an earlier incarnation. Um, So um, I guess I can just start a kind cluster over here. Yeah, let, we can try that. I see Premchand giving another command. Maybe we tried it already. Uh, oh, logs dash dash previous. Let's see. Hmm, interesting. Let's okay. see. Leader election lost. None of this seems they're looking to. to... Yeah. <laughs> Probably worth it for trying kind as plan B. Yeah. Um, so one thing took me a while, few oh, years, one or I two need years to update back. My kind. Oh yeah, yeah, one twenty two. <laughs> so the blog actually has a link to the specific config that allows you to enable the feature gate. So we oh, might yeah. want to try that. Let's go back over there and uh, so yeah. So here is the kind cluster definition. Yeah. Um, and Lackey kindly also added the specific image for one twenty two in his next command, so we get the latest version. Um, wait, you said he included yeah. it in there or we so, need to upgrade kind to ba basically what we need to do now is the, the cluster YAML file, we need somewhere saved so we can use it. And then the next command, if you notice, it has an image flag, which says, uh, get me the node image for one. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, great. And for folks who were always wondering for a while when they just heard of kind like me, uh, at least few months back, years back, kind is actually Kubernetes in Docker uh, acronym, where K is the Kubernetes and D is the Docker, which essentially allows you to have Kubernetes using Docker in your laptop to sort of mimic what you will see when a cluster actually exists. Um, okay, let's see what happened there. Oh, um, someone's formatting turned um, double dashes into M dashes. Oh, okay. We'll need to delete that, looks like. Just delete the kind cluster. So kind is really nice because it lets you um, just uh, spin up. Oh, is it just me or we lost even? Maybe just me.
lost you. Not sure. If... Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there, but um, we seem to be back. Yes. All right. Great. <laughs> um, I don't think it's Windows, although I did have an interesting bug the last time um, that I did TGIK where it turned out I'd fallen back to Ethernet because the um, the nick on the motherboard had actually gone bad a week or so earlier. And I didn't realize it. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, okay, so it looks like Carlos took a screenshot when both of us were frozen. So that's going to be excellent. interesting to look at later. Um, let's see, starting the control plane. So do you want to talk a little bit about some of the changes? Um, you've mentioned them a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I did the main thing for me was just the sheer amount of extra legwork we had to do to get the cluster rule, cluster rule binding and everything in place. And just like the ability to have exception list very clear as a set of YAML uh, arrays or list. I think those are the big changes for me that I've, I really enjoyed looking at. And, and the main thing which was made as a clear assumption when building this was we will always have for any complex scenario existing admission controllers that are external to Kubernetes that can be used for advanced special scenarios. But at the same time, if somebody cannot or don't want to use something outside of Kubernetes, we should have a bare bones admission controller within Kubernetes that allows you to do something basic instead of having root everywhere when you can create a pod. So that's really the main thinking behind building this. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to how it looks like for others and hear stories for folks who have actually been able to adopt this. So um, while we're starting the control plane, I'm going to pop back over here. Oh, I got a timeout starting the control plane. That's Awesome. Huh. Um, what does it say? Uh, it said that it got a TCP connection refused. Um, so do you remember how over here we were looking at these, you know, policies defined by the pod security standards? Um, is this some new work, the pod security standards that, you know, when did this come about? Yeah. So if my memory serves right, this came before pod security admission came into being. And the reasoning behind that was people were saying, okay, I everything makes sense. Like pod security policy is something you want to do. It's not great, but it is something. But what people were looking from the community was what policy is good, what policy is bad. Because sometimes as we saw 70 plus fields, it's hard to figure out what makes sense and what doesn't. So this was essentially- And if you get any one of those wrong, yeah, it exactly. may be just like you didn't, you didn't put any effort in at all. Correct. In terms of and, outcome. And th just think about like typos again in that, yeah. where you're just saying H HAST instead of host path. And then something suddenly works that you thought didn't work. Mm -hmm. So this came into being as a very opinionated set of pod security policies, which you can start to use immediately by just copy pasting the policies and create the PSP objects. But it doesn't mean that this, these are the only three that will be supported in Kubernetes. You can mix and match, you can modify, you can go and have so, multiple so policies this, too. This, you can also use something like OPA if you right. want to rule out, you know, oh, hey, I don't want anyone using, you know, EBS volumes directly or something like that. You can still put those policies in separately from pod security policy, but you kind of have these three profiles, which is privileged, which is like, you know, I trust these folks and they got to do some crazy stuff. So like they can privilege escalate if they need to. And I trust them to just not do it. Um, you've got baseline which is, um, you know, hey, we don't think there's any problems here. Like you're a normal container, um, but I'm not going to bug you too much about like hardening things. And then restricted is like, hey, you need to actually harden your configurations and your pods. You need to say you're not going to run as root. You need to, um, let's see, what are some of the other stuff? Yeah, and this is mostly also about 
multi tenancy uh, which mm-hmm. is another interesting and opinionated word where if you want untrusted workloads running in the same cluster you want to isolate it as much as possible so that's where the restricted policy comes into picture um yeah so it looks like that rules out a bunch of volume types um basically anything that's not csi or anything that that's not container storage interface um using persistent volumes gets ruled out um uh a bunch of the privilege escalation settings on oh look if you didn't remember to set this for all the different container types um you could have a problem in your policy so this kind of cans all that stuff together and has whoever's publishing kubernetes is the one who needs to know this rather than whoever is yeah. um running kubernetes yeah exactly and we can so what do you want to do should we look at the timeout error or just go deep um, into admission uh and how it looks maybe like. yeah it seems like the kubelet isn't running or healthy is what it said mm. um, also we i don't know if we want to spend our time your... debugging kubelet or talking about some of the other interesting yeah so we are seeing your browser just so you know not yeah, the terminal. Know. okay um, cool that's what i that's what i wanted to show right now because i thought that yeah um i i added a note on the recent documentation that was added in mm-hmm. for pod security admission we can go through that and kind of explain like what this looks like if you want to implement so, it so um let's see so this is our config and it has pod security and we did those other things so i'm kind of inclined to have a no psa Trust me because I don't have a Windows editor, but we're going to try taking out the feature gates and see if it's kind altogether that's unhappy or um, if it's a problem with the feature gate. Yeah. And I think if this doesn't work, we'll just hop onto the docs and look at what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I think somebody asked about the WAN feature also. So maybe I'll talk about that a bit. Mm-hmm. Basically, there are uh, two feature, three different uh, modes in which you can imp- implement this or apply it. One is WAN, one is audit, and another is enforce. So WAN and audit are sort of similar. The only difference is WAN, when uh, implemented, will log anything that is going to fail if you apply this policy in the output of your command line. So if you say, okay, do so this. The user sees. Exactly. Hey, your stuff's not gonna work, like Correct. a deprecation. Exactly. So if if I'm a user and I think that there was another similar feature added for deprecation, deprecated APIs, where the user could say, okay, I'm using something deprecated and I need to take care of it. So it's kind of similar logic here where I can see if something is not going to work for me uh, if I've set it in one mode for my namespace. And the other one is audit, where if I'm a cluster admin and I have access to my audit logs, it will log it in your audit log uh, of Kubernetes API saying this is going to fail if you enforce it. So that allows you to have a different point of view in terms of where to look at some if something is failing and also allows some visibility into uh, what could fail for others who are not the actual owners of the pods that are going to fail. So that's always helpful. And that's why the two modes exist. And enforce is kind of the name suggests what it means is essentially, I'm going to enforce this policy and things will break if something is not going to work for you. Did the non-PSA cluster get created? I've been wondering if that will be happier for some reason. Yeah. Did the non-PSA one get created? The non-PSA one also did not get created. Oh, okay. So that suggests that it's a problem with Docker not being happy on my Windows machine. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I have tested this on Mac as well, so I'm not sure in Windows. But 
I this this definitely the blog details if you follow along more or less I've seen it work but let's see oh here we go oh okay, looks like, great it looks like it's simply a matter of um, trying again not having busted docker on your desktop yeah yeah <laughs> exactly sometimes the stars have to align as well now in this case um, I have a prompt to update and restart docker desktop that I had ignored ah okay probably yeah. because i was in the midst of um running yay all right yes yeah we have okay so so we need to set context and while you're doing that i'll answer one question uh we have one audit and enforces three modes you can set and uh, basically one is going to give you the warning when you are trying to create a pod that is going to fail and audit is going to also silently log an error but in the api server audit log instead of showing the user who is trying to create the pod so audit lets system administrators figure out if i switch this over who's going to break yeah and warn lets users figure out oh man i'm going to get broken if you know in the future yeah if i'm not more careful about things exactly and, and this is another interesting uh, topic where uh, you you can also uh, figure out that okay what does really dry run mean in this case so uh, dry run is something before the pod is created you can see if something is going to fail and this is after the pod is created it will allow you to create the pod but it will still log some error or a warning in this like technically it's a warning to share, share that this might fail when you enforce it so that's the main difference and one thing to note which came up in one of the work i was doing recently on the nsac herning blog uh, we wrote for kubernetes uh, was does pod security admission and psp behave in the same way for existing pods so the answer behind that is both are admission controllers. So because you have a gate when you're creating the pod for both of them, any existing pods do not get any updates or do not get affected based on what you have set up in your admission controller. So that's always something to keep in mind when we're dealing with both of them. All right, so I, I'll stop talking. Let's try to get this working with at least okay, one namespace. Let's see. Um... So how do we actually apply this to a cluster? Yeah, so if we go back to that blog, yep. uh, we'll have one example for a cluster and one example for a namespace. OK, let's see. So Carlos is saying, my I sound like I really enjoy working with Kubernetes. <laughs> so I, I mean, believe it or not, this was like I started in cloud native uh, in terms of my cloud career. And Kubernetes was pretty early in my career as well. So I've seen how bad it is in the has it it has been in the past and the improvements that we have done now, it just makes me feel happy and grateful that oh, I get to contribute to make this better. So that's really what it is. You want to talk a little bit about um, about this command? Um, yes. and it's a little different than the other commands that we've Add. Correct. I just want to make sure there is, I think, one more command that precedes this, which might be useful also. Uh, let's see, unless I missed it. Yeah, so uh, this explains a bit about uh, one mode, yeah. audit mode, and enforce mode. Yeah, so you're right. I think this is the first one command. So yeah. if we look at this, basically what it's trying to say is my namespace is uh, test ns, and I'm going to set the baseline pod security standard. So if you remember uh, the port security standards we just talked about, we are using in port security admission the same three standards as mm -hmm. something that we are going to set built in in Kubernetes. And what that will allow you to do now is I'm going to set my uh, namespace setting for port security as baseline one. So anything that is going to fail my baseline standard, I'm going to get a warning for it. And it also says that my one version is 122, which is the recent version. So, well, and the any... other thing is, this is using labels on existing resources. This isn't creating 
Um, I'm not creating a new resource, a new pod security policy or a new RBAC policy um, or binding the RBAC policy to a set of credentials. Um, this is um, basically, we've said, the way that you do this enforcement is by namespace. E so exactly. You Correct. can't have user A in a namespace can create certain types of pods, but user B can't. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So that that's the main thing. Like the labels are applied at namespace object level. So anything in that namespace, which is a pod, is going to get the same setting. And this is where if the way you have been doing PSPs is having different uh, policies applied to different pods in the same namespace, you have to be really careful when you're migrating because now your namespace may have higher permissions than some pods need. Um, so, uh, Ramachandran seems to be asking Docker engine is sitting between containers and the host OS. Um, so that's actually container D it's not necessarily Docker engine. Um, but, uh, but, um, it orchestrates things, but then the underlying OS, um, like when you call open or, you know, um, socket or something like that, that goes directly to the Linux kernel. Um, the container engine just sets things up, puts you in a, a corner that's supposed to be yours and maybe sets some limits on you before it execs your pod. And then after that, you're talking directly to the OS. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, but Choco has another interesting question about what does it mean to pin the version to um, 1.22? Correct. So what this will mean is anything that is uh, implemented as a security feature that can be set using the pod security standard until 122, you get to use all of them and all of those will be enforced. But let's say now I have a 123 cluster and a new feature, something like ABC security is implemented. I'm not going to be able to warn you on ABC security feature because I am only going to look at features uh, on 122 or before that were implemented. And that also potentially means that you could decide in say 124 that there's a feature that um, maybe should be getting a little more scrutiny than it is right now. You know, maybe yeah. it's a bad idea to be able to open UDP ports as a hypothetical. Like mm -hmm. UDP probably isn't isn't it, but you could say, hey, in 124 we're going to start enforcing that you can't open UDP ports. Right. You know, listen on UDP ports. Before that, you can. And yeah. so you can actually upgrade your cluster to 124 without either opening a security hole or breaking existing users. And you can set these warn, because these are labels, you can set warn and audit and enforce separately. Yeah, exactly. And this kind of reduces of the friction a bit because now I might need a new feature that is really great in a newer version, but I also have to now deal with a security feature that I don't know whether it's going to break something. So by being able to pin to a previous version, I get the new feature that is needed for let's say performance, but I don't have to worry about the security feature at least while I'm upgrading and I can take care of it later. Um, another thing that's actually really nice here is that in, in a different direction, I could say enforce baseline Warn restricted, and then um, people would get notified. Hey, you know, I'm going to let you run this thing, yeah. but it would be nice if you hardened it a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is one of the exciting parts. I feel like we should always make it easier to move to secure defaults in a gradual way instead of just making a mandate. You shall now only run in secure by default mode. So this allows you to know and get some idea. OK, I'm going to get enforced soon, so I might as well start figuring out why I'm getting these warnings. So this is a good point. And one call out I want to make on that is uh, as part of security tag work, we've been working to define how we could do secure by default design for all cloud native apps. And for that, we have a very simple two-page document, which I'm adding in the notes, called uh, Secure Default Cloud Native 8, which is sort of uh, inspired from uh, PEP 8, which is a Python style guide. So this is uh, open for comment until the end of this month. And it basically gives 
some guiding principles on if you follow this, you'll have a better experience moving to secure by default. So if anyone in, is interested, want to add comments or talk to me, I'll really appreciate uh, comment there. Or if you want to share it with others, go ahead and share that link with others. It should be open for all for comment uh, for all the folks on the internet, essentially. So no permissions, extra permissions needed. You need a Google account, but yeah. Hopefully, yes, we, we you do but have. There are some places where it's harder to get to Google services. Though. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So if you do go through that uh, and somebody doesn't have access, I don't mind if you want to send a PDF also. As long as we get feedback, I don't mind. However, uh, we get it. Um. Yeah. So the next thing here is kind of neat um, about dry run. Yeah. Do you want to say anything more there, or just let people read? Yeah, so bit. dry run is, I think, like we discussed before I get to create a pod, I get to see what might fail, what will actually different. pass. This is actually really neat. This is a dry run on applying a label to the namespace. Right, exactly. And this tells you when you say, when you say, oh, I'm thinking about applying this label that will enforce on future pods in this namespace, it will warn you about all the existing pods that don't meet that standard. It's not going to take them out of the namespace, Correct. but you won't be able to create any more like it. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And so dry run here is a really neat use of the Kubernetes API to say, hey, what would happen if I increase the restriction level? Yeah, exactly. And dry run, if folks who have done CK and CKD might remember is a lifesaver to save time when doing uh, passing CKD and CK. So this is another good real world use case of dry run, not just to pass certifications. This is, this is in particular the dry run server. Yeah. Flag. Exactly. Um, oh, and here's the example. So yeah, enforce baseline, audit restricted, mm -hmm. and warn restricted. Correct. Um, and you could also, um, you know, set a enforce baseline version you know, V122, right. you know, audit restricted V123 or something like that when that comes out. Yeah, um, exactly. And if you notice, you can set audit and one at the same time to the same level. So you get visibility into as a cluster admin and also as a user, if you want to see what is going to fail. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say that um, if we kind of look at the API change, um, I'd kind of break it up into a couple different categories. The first thing was that PSP was really fine grained. You could apply it to users. You could apply it to service accounts. You could X out individual like capabilities one by one and say, I'm okay with X, but not Y. Right. Um, pod security admission is a lot simpler. Um, there's a lot fewer knobs and so forth to adjust. Um, the second one is, um, that there's been some thought about how do you roll this out? How do you make it upgrade safe? How do you make it safe to turn on? Um, and so it's got some versioning capabilities and um, it by default, when you turn it on, it doesn't do anything until you take some other affirmative action to get it enforced. Um, whereas with pod security policy, you had to create all your pod security policies um, on the cluster. You had to know they were right but you couldn't test they were right until you flipped the flag. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if and you were wrong, you ended up possibly with funny things like my API server pod not getting mirrored anymore. Right, right. Um, and, and also, like, you, we couldn't assume that any existing ports are not going to get harmed because if you implement something and you haven't done a dry run and a pod gets killed for whatever reason, they are not going to come up again. So that's where the dry run topic uh, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the third piece um, is that they've thought a lot about how to communicate mm -hmm. this to the user. And you know stuff like having dry run work and warn you about what's going on in your current cluster um, and having warn and audit so that you can both communicate to the system administrator and to the end user, depending on who needs to, who's responsible for that stuff. And that right. that's not always the same and you know, Sometimes you expect developers to DevOps and do the right thing. And sometimes you expect cluster administrators to go in and like talk to people about, hey, you got to change stuff and I'm going to help you because 
we don't really expect you to know Kubernetes. We just expect you to work off of some template. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's where the people who ended up designing this were from end user background. And as a result of that, they had known the pain and the organizational problems and things that everyone needs visibility on. So some of that magic is coming into this implementation. It it doesn't mean it's perfect, but hopefully it's better than the one that's it that is getting replaced. And it looks like there is um, one new, at the end of this, we see a, a Kubernetes resource that is actually new. Yeah. Um, and it looks like this is the configuration for the pod security defaults. So if you want to ship um, and say, hey, all namespaces should be at least baseline, nobody's allowed to run privileged, right. then um, you can actually go in here and do that. So hopefully we'll see um, as 122 rolls out, um, distros starting to say, you know, hey, we're going to ship with a default pod security that isn't wide open. Yeah, yeah. Or and, we'll put one that's default wide open because we know a lot of people are still like doing correct. stuff like that. But um, we're also going to put a, you know, warn restricted right. on there to steer correct. people towards doing the right thing. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I've been an end user before as well. Uh, and one of the things this maps to like real world human interaction is all the security folks don't understand kubernetes as much as we would want them to right so what <laughs> what would what would make sense for them is what After policy being at KubeCon, i'm not sure i understand kubernetes as much as i thought it, i did exactly <laughs> exactly so like all of us are learning and if we just throw a lot of jargon it's not going to help anyone so if we can give a nice story and tell them that hey our default enforced pod security policy today is baseline and we are going to make sure and all the pods uh, automatically get this info and applied regardless of what they are doing. Uh, and this is our cluster level policy. So this allows them some confidence that at cluster level that we are doing the right thing and we are catching things that might be uh, scary. And then one or two years later, you can say we are always trying to take care of security more and more. So slowly, slowly, we are going to now move from baseline to restricted and forced. And that gives a good story of how you're moving towards more secure default by actually looking at the object that you can say. And all the third party auditors, all the people who have to go through audits for compliance can give like evidence of this saying, hey, this is my cluster level policy. So this is what we actually implement in our all our clusters. Yeah, so um, one thing, I didn't actually read all the text before I looked at the YAML and talked about it. Um, so that's my bad. Um, it looks like this this YAML object is actually a file that you need to pass to your API server on the command line. Like, it's not a resource in the cluster. Right, right. Um, and we can actually kind of realize that because it doesn't have metadata on there. Mm. Um, and if you don't have metadata on there, then you can't have a name. And so you can't really fit into um, the way the API server likes to manage things. Correct. That's a good point. I didn't realize uh, that too. I didn't realize it at first either until someone was asking. Then I actually read the text above. Yeah. <laughs> so Lachlan's post also goes over this pretty well, but I thought um, there's, um, I thought it was interesting the set of API decisions that had changed between pod security policy and um, and uh, pod security admission. Yeah, exactly. And the exemptions are the exception list I talked about earlier, where you can say some of my parts are always going to need a privilege because it's it's the reality. Sometimes you do, and you get to say, okay, these namespaces, you're fine. You can do whatever you want. But one thing I would also suggest is make sure you don't give permission for that namespace to all the users in your cluster restricted to maybe cluster admins or some folks who really need it, like potentially your DevOps, sec DevOps or security person who needs to run maybe some CNI plugins. So that's something to keep in mind. I was thinking like, CNI plugins or something like Metal LB yeah, are examples exactly. of things that probably are going to need exceptions. Correct, exactly. Um, yeah. Well, I am... I am excited 
that um, this is this is one of those things that that beta policy that you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. um, you alluded to, it was around Kubernetes one eighteen or thereabouts, I think. I believe so. Yeah. That the that you know the the API. You can't be beta to, to kick yeah. in and say, hey, yeah. you know, you can't be in beta for more than a year without making changes to your API. Right. If you're in beta for more than a year, if you're ingress or pod security policy or one of these other things, you need to either figure out how to ship a V1 and then we're going to retire your beta APIs or you need to roll the new beta or you need to say we're going away and someone else has to try solving this. Correct, correct. And I think as luck would have it, Coincidentally, SIG security also was formed around the same time. So it was not just SIGOT's responsibility anymore. And there were friends who could help out from SIG security. And I'm really glad this is how this has turned out. Uh, we'll probably have a lot more improvements in migration of from PSP to PSA uh, in the next few releases. And yeah, because it's alpha and beta, you get to also decide the roadmap and the future. So if you have something that might be helpful, you've actually run this in real world and have lessons to share, hop on to SIGOTH or SIG security meetings and let us know. And since this is an alpha feature, you're not going to be able to get this off of um, like, you, you probably won't be able to get this off of your cloud providers until the next release right um, i mean they, they it, tend to yeah. not turn on the alpha flags correct um, correct so. but it's it's worth playing around in dev environments and yeah. see what happens kind is a good place to do this um yes. it's really fast to spin things up assuming your docker is working yeah i agree <laughs> right. yeah my docker is still busted yeah, so again, reminder, PSP will be removed in 125. And uh, so we, we're we not there yet. One, 125 is not the next release, not the next release, but it's it's deprecated for sure. So we should, if you are using- In about PSP a year, users, the latest Kubernetes will no longer have pod security policy. Correct. We have quarterly releases from last release or so, I think. So- quarter it's, releases it's mean, three a year now oh yeah you're right sorry i was uh <laughs> misremembering three and four months as quarter correct yeah. you're right so three a year so that means if 122 is your latest 125 is three three versions from now yep yeah so um feel free to continue filling in any notes on talks and so forth or other exciting stuff. Oh, Nginx, Ingress Nginx um, CVE. I wonder if I can guess what this one's about. Um, oh, fun. Allows retrieval of service account token. Yes. Um, one interesting thing to remember here is just upgrading is not going to help. There are some other additional steps that are needed to actually be able to mitigate this in in some way or another. Uh, it looks like you need to also add an additional um, right. config map setting. Yeah. Um, and it Did looks like maybe they allowed you to um, inject snippets of other configuration and it looks like a standard escaping type vulnerability. Yeah, exactly. Um, and this again points to the fact that don't give access to everything to all the users. But, but pod security is not going to help you with this. Exactly. Correct. <laughs> and, and, and if you really don't trust the other tenants, uh, don't uh, run them in the same cluster because something like this could happen. Yeah. Um, amusingly, Carlos was pointing out that um, you your Nginx ingress might need to be privileged, um, but Hopefully it doesn't need to be privileged. Hopefully at best it needs to be baseline and um, it shouldn't necessarily need to even do that. Um, mm -hmm. I recently poked the contour team and they realized that they could actually move, stop binding to port 80 and just use a higher number container port. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So hopefully your ingress doesn't actually need to be privileged. Yes. Um, Metal LB does cause it needs to either send ARPs or play with the routing table in funny ways. But yeah. um, 
I, but if you're I, just an ingress and not a load balancer, hopefully that doesn't apply. Yeah. <laughs> I also like we got official word on when 125 can be expected from our oh, yeah. Emeritus release lead, Nabarun. So he says uh, it will be around July, August 2022. So about eight, nine months from now. It'll take a little bit longer after that for it to get into your hands unless you're running kind. But um, right. And one thing to remember is started. correct. One thing to remember is uh, upstream supports n minus two releases. So we will still end up patching 125 after this, most likely for a couple of releases. But it's definitely time to start thinking about migrating for sure. And if if PSP. Uh, if you need f PSP features that aren't in pod security, um, you can still you can still use tools like OPA. Yeah. Um, or Caverno. Caverno, yeah. mm -hmm. Caverno is yeah. another um, policy agent that works for all different types of resources. So you may need both that, and you may want a belt and suspenders with pod security admission controller because. Um, it's easy to do now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Um, I managed to break at least one cluster and my discover that my local Docker was broken. So, um, yeah, so same fun. here. Same here. I <laughs> loved a lot. I loved uh, to learn how to fail publicly. So this was great, and it was nice to see comments from everyone all around the world. Oh, JS policy. There's another, um, another, another admission web hook. Or Carlos points out you can write your own admission webhook if you yes. love that sort of thing. Okay. Well, we'll see you all next week. Um, I think it's going to be Brian Lyles talking yep. about something that Brian Lyles finds interesting. Yes, I'm excited for Could that too. All right. See you, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Ewan. It was fun. Yep.